Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this room. You are the teacher of the church, and we welcome you to come and to teach us in the name of Jesus. I offer all that I am unto you, Almighty God. Use this vessel, I pray, Lord, to bring forth your word and anoint every ear to hear what you would say in the name of Jesus. And together we say, demons, you are bound. You are defeated. You will not hinder the word of God from going forth. And you will not steal the word. You will not distract and hinder in any way. Not only in this class, but all the classes that are going on right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Now, Father God, we bless you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Now, if you would, just right there where you are, let's just lift our hands before the Lord and worship Him. Just out loud worship Him, Father, in the name of Jesus. And we bless you, Lord God, in Jesus' holy name. Amen and amen. We're, of course, in this series called Reigning Free. And it's, uh, the message tonight is called Permission Granted. Before I jump right into that, be sure before you leave that you sign in and grab an outline that we have over here. And if you've missed any classes, we've got all the outlines there, so be sure that you get what you need. But permission granted. We're going to answer some questions in this series of teachings, and one of them is going to be, do we ever, as believers, grant Satan permission to come against us or to take us into bondage in an area. We're going to look at that. Secondly, God ever grant, does he ever grant Satan permission to come against us or take us into bondage in an area? Well, you know, when you look through the Old Testament, as I've said before, when you begin to read about the children of Israel, you think that they would wake up and smell the roses. But it appears that, you know, here they are following after the things of God. And then all at once, this it would be introduced some kind of idol or the women of another country. And before you know, they start giving their attention to those kinds of things. And we know then that, that the spirit uh, of worship to idols would come in. And obviously this is sinful. And if they had continued in that, it could be the very destruction of their lives. So what happened was, is the enemy would come in with the temptations. But when bad things started happening, right, that's when the children of Israel cry out, God forgive us, God forgive us. And we see that over and over and over through the Old Testament. So right there is proof enough that sometimes we can see that God does allow <laughs> Satan to come in and do those things. But now let me say this. If we believe it's God's will for us to be attacked by demonic spirits, guess what? We're not going to war against them. You know, if God is going to allow the devil to do this and this, then I just might as well sit back and let it happen. No. What it is, when you begin to see things happen in your personal life or your family, the first thing I know I do is I'll say, God, have I opened the door for the wicked one to come in? If I have, then God reveal that to me, Lord, and I will repent and I will make that thing right. But sometimes it's just an onslaught of the demons that are coming against you just because you house the presence of God. The devil hates you. He hates me. So he would try to come and distract us and hinder us from being who God has called us to be. So when we've judged ourselves and we're not seeing that we have opened the door through something we said or done or some kind of sin, then you take authority over any demon that may be working in the situation. Let me add this. I know I've heard people say, well, you know, my washing machine tore up, and then it was my dryer, and then, you know, and they start talking about all this stuff. And so immediately they think of some demons have come to live with them. You know, that's possible. That's possible that the enemy has come in just to try to tear stuff up. But you know, things do get old in this world, if you agree. Yeah. It's not always a demon. Sometimes things wear out. 
And uh, the devil doesn't really have anything to do with it. But I've said to you before, if I'm in doubt or I'm wondering, I just take authority over him anyway. I just love to give him a good old punch with the name of Jesus any, anyway. Okay. So we saw in our past teaching that Satan, the demons, they are thieves. The Bible's very clear that the enemy, he cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come to give you life and to give it to you in abundance. So when we think about God allowing demonic spirits to come in because of some kind of sin, I can promise you it's always for the good of that person. It is never to hurt somebody or to destroy their lives. God loves people. So when we think that the enemy is coming against us, sometimes then things will begin to happen. We'll cry out unto God, and he is able to come to our aid and minister to us. This, the devil is always looking for a way to come into our lives. In the book of Joel, in fact, it's chapter 2, verse 9. It says that he will come in through windows, or he will come in through an open door. When you think about your house, your entrance into your home is going to be through a door or through a window. Well, we are the house of God. Amen? We house the Holy Spirit. So the enemy wants to get into our house. When we begin to look at the lively stones the Bible talks about, each one of us make a part of the habitation of our God. And the enemy would love to come in among us, and he would like to steal, and he would like to hinder this church body. But we, again, we have authority over him in Jesus' name. One of the main ways that believers open the door to Satan is through pride. Now, we're talking about <coughs> believers being oppressed by demonic spirits. Now, we see the people in the world, and we know demonic spirits can work through them. But as far as coming against them with the attack sometimes we as believers see, he already has them. He is already maybe using them. But we want to really focus on the people of God. Because I look around, and, I, and I've told you, God has revealed to me at times that there would be somebody who's truly born again, and they love the Lord. But at the same time, there are demonic spirits that's working in their lives, and they don't even realize it. Do you hear me today? But one of the big ones is pride, and I think you'll agree with me when we look at the scriptures concerning this. What is pride? It is trusting in your own strength. We're going to look at some of the other meanings. But the first one is trusting in your own strength. And so many times, people, they're believers, and they feel like, well, you know, I've always been able to do this, and I'll do it again. You know, I feel like I've been preaching most of my life, but every time that I stand to minister, whether it's here at the church or if it's on our television program, I realize how needy I am. I can do nothing without the Lord. Now, I can do things out of memory, but if it doesn't have the anointing of the Spirit of God upon it, it is not going to accomplish very much. But I am so grateful that I see my need for Jesus. In all that I do, I must have Him. Now, if I think I can do it and I don't really need to study this time, I can just do this, let me tell you, that can become pride in a hurry. And that is very dangerous. We'll see more about that. But pride is trusting in your own strength. In Luke chapter 22, I think you have your passage there, verse 31 through 32. It says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, Behold, Satan hath desired or asked to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted or returned, strengthen thy brethren. Now, this is a very powerful verse here. But Jesus is telling Simon, which is Peter again, Satan hath asked to have you. He is asked to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Now let me tell you, Jesus comes telling me that, I'm going to take heed. Would you not? I mean, if Jesus is telling me that, but I can say this to all of us tonight. Satan desires to sift you and to sift me. He wants to destroy us. 
because we are a threat to the kingdom of darkness. Satan would have to have Peter before he could sift him as wheat. And when I say have, we know that Peter was a believer. But there would be something in his life that opened up the door or the window for the devil to come in. What would that be? I think you'll see it again in Scripture. He would, the devil, have control over Peter. Now, what does it mean, sift? When Jesus is telling some and some and Satan desires to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. <coughs> sift means an inward agitation to try one's faith to the verge of overthrow. Now, that can happen in a lot of ways. But, for example, if you've been raised in a home and there was a lot of fear, things happen. You never know, knew when somebody was going to come in and maybe be drunk or angry and they start abusing somebody in the home. If you've been raised like that and then you move into adulthood and you begin to be fearful that somebody's going to come in and hurt you again or somebody in your family. This can be an ongoing, if you will, agitation inside to try your faith. In other words, faith is the victory that overcomes the world, and that is right with God. But fear, and I'm talking about a fear of what the enemy is saying, the fear can be that something bad is going to happen to my family. So that's going to be an agitation that's going to work against faith. And notice that meaning it means to the verge of overthrow. So the enemy wants to sift. He wants to stop. He wants to hinder. Jesus had prayed for Peter that his faith would not fail him. Aren't you glad the Lord ever liveth to make intercession for you and me? Thank you, Jesus. When thou art converted, notice that in that passage of Scripture. It is a prophetic word. In other words, Peter, you are going to sin. You're going to do wrong, but you are going to come back to me. You're going to repent of that. So Peter would walk away in his faith, but the prophetic words that he would come back to Jesus. And Jesus told Peter that after he repented, he was to strengthen his brethren. You'd think that would be enough for him to be alert and watchful. But we know what happened. Jesus is telling a believer here that Satan desires to sift him as wheat. That's the words of Jesus. We don't have to wonder if demonic spirits will or will not come against us. Jesus is very clear. Satan has asked for you, Peter. Luke 22, verses 31 through 32 in the NIV, it says this, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I pray for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. We know the New Testament is written in Greek. And in the Greek, there can be four or five meanings of any given word. You know, even when we read the word love, you know, we'll say, uh, I love my dog, but I love to eat beef jerky. Or I love all people. All different kinds of love. But when we look at the Hebrew Bible and the words in Greek, we see that there are many facets of the word love. But the one I want us to look at that just is so interesting is the word ask. In other words, when Jesus said, Satan hath asked to have you, well, what does that mean? Well, again, when we're looking at the word ask, the lexicon definition concerning this particular passage, it means to ask for something and to receive, and to receive what one asked for, to ask for with success. <clears throat> now I want you to notice this is a specific meaning for this word ask. It's not just asking and walking away and wondering if we'll get the answer. But this asking means I ask, but I also get a response, an answer, an affirmative of what I am asking. So think with me a minute. Satan is asking that he may sift you, Peter, as we. In other words, he's asked, but he receives. 
Now let me tell you, you and I would not pick up on that because ask is just simply making a petition, if you will. But the people that were there, and even Peter, would have known that Satan has asked for him, but he also receives the answer. How could he do that? Because he had a legal right to come in against Peter. Why? I think again, you will see that soon. Okay, so in the Luke 22, 31 through 32, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. Now, Satan asked and he received permission. The American Standard says he has demanded permission to sift him as wheat. Notice that. The Bible says that Satan demanded permission from God to sift him as wheat. How can that be? Because there was an entrance into his life. There was a window or a door that he gave place to the enemy. Now, let me just interject right here. We've all sinned in this room and come short of the glory of God. It's hard to even drive down the interstate anymore without sinning, especially when they cut you off. Amen? You know, I didn't do anything with my fingers. Okay, but we do this. We get angry. We get upset with individuals. And I know I have just like, what is wrong with you? Are you stupid? Stupid? I know you can't believe I would say that, but I do. I have just been so upset. And then I say, Lord, forgive me. But God, I pray that they don't bring any hurt or harm to themselves or anybody else in the name of Jesus. So we do fail. We do come short of the glory of God at times. But you know when your scripture says it this way, when your heart condemns you, and you know that you have said something you shouldn't have said or done something, just be quick to repent. And you know, one of the hardest things I think that we can do, and um, I hate to admit it, but when I know I'm wrong and Robert has told me one thing and I've got to say I'm sorry and I really don't want to, but anyway, that's pride. But you know, I have to bite my tongue and say, Robert, you were right and I was wrong and I ask you to forgive me. I feel a lot better, but it's difficult, right? You all don't have that problem, I can tell. It's just me. <laughs> But you know, I know I have to do that because I don't want any open doors or windows to the enemy where he can come into my life. So we need to humble ourselves, the scripture says, under the mighty hand of God. And what he said, then I will exalt you in due time. Amen. So that's good to know that. But um, again, when the enemy is wanting to come against us, he's waiting for open doors. And this is the reason... Don't, don't, here's one scripture. It says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. If, if you've got issues with your mate or somebody in the family, try to take care of that before you go to bed because the enemy will come in on the wings of that and he will try to enter in if that is not taken care of when you go to bed at night, okay? That doesn't mean that you have to call all your children before you go to bed and try to deal with everything at once. But if there's been something and you can Try to take care of that. We just, what's the scripture say? Don't give place to the devil. Don't give him any foothold into your life. So just be quick to repent. All right. The enemy has a right to sift him as wheat. Why? Because of sin. We're going to look at what that sin was. What would that door be? He believed in his own strength. I'm going to say it again. Peter believed in his own strength. He had pride. Peter had pride. How do you get that, Charlotte? Well, I think when we look at these passages again, you will see that. But Matthew, Mark, and John record what was said before this conversation about Satan asking for Peter. Let's look at these passages. So if you have your Bibles, let's look at Mark, your phone, whatever it is you use. Mark 14. Mark 14, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 27. Mark 14, verse 27. And Jesus said unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. And he's talking about the disciples that was there with him. But after that I am risen. Now right there, Jesus is prophesying. I am going to rise from the dead. He said it right there. 
I will go before you into Galilee. But Peter said unto him, said unto Jesus, Although all shall be offended, yet will not I. Okay? Now, the Lord Jesus had just said that all of you will deny me. All of you will be offended. But Peter is rebuking the Lord Jesus Christ by saying, They might, but I won't. Right? And Peter said to him, Although all should be offended, yet will not I. And Jesus said unto him, Verily, I say unto thee, that this day, even in this night, before the cock crows twice, thou shalt deny me thrice, or three times. So he's saying, Peter, you're not going to just deny me once, but you're going to deny me three times. 31, but he spake, Peter spoke more vehemently, if I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. Likewise also said they all. They were all said, oh Jesus, we would never, we would never go against you. We would never run away from you, Lord. I want you to notice that. Because what? Every one of them does, right? I think John uh, probably stayed in there as close as he possibly could. But they did. They all denied the Lord. But pride says, my strength is sufficient. My strength says that I can go up against anybody and I will never deny you. He was looking at what he thought was his ability. But Jesus turned and said, Peter, get behind, no, he said, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. I want you to notice that. He looks at Peter. He is not calling him Satan, but he addresses Satan that is working in Peter's life. And I want you to see this. Peter is in pride. That the demon had come in into Peter's life. And I'm not saying that he was lost and going to hell because of this. I'm not saying that at all. But I am saying that pride was in his life. And Jesus is addressing the demonic spirit that is working through him to decree and to declare that, uh, that, that he's okay, that he's all right, but we know he wasn't. So Peter, when he heard uh, the Lord say to this, the scripture says that he took Jesus to the side and he rebuked Jesus. He said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. So I want you to know Peter is trying to correct what Jesus is saying when Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is speaking truth. But there again, Peter is rejecting his words and trying to correct the master. When Jesus tells you something, you can bank on it. You, you can't pray hard enough. You can't fast enough. When Jesus says something, listen to what he's saying. Now, if he deals with your heart, I want you to make war in this area. I want you to stand against this. Yes, you fight as God leads you. But if he is making a declaration to you, you can know that it is surely coming to pass. So Jesus addressed Satan in a man. Peter trusted in his own strength. You remember, Peter cuts off the ear of man in the garden. He's really trying to kill him, right? There may have been a hundred soldiers that was there that night to take Jesus. We don't know. The scripture doesn't tell us. But it says that Peter is going to take them on. He has a sword and he cuts the soldier's ear off when he's really trying to hit his head. Thinking, I, I have the strength. I can take on all these men that has come out with their torches. Let me tell you, that is a very serious thing. What's the scripture said? Take heed when you think you stand, lest you fall. And that's true for every one of us. Be, just beware. Take heed that you think you're standing and you got it all together. Scripture said, lest you fall. Now, that doesn't mean I'm worried all the time I'm going to mess up, I'm going to miss God. No, it simply means that whatever God calls me to do, whatever God calls you to do, that I am dependent upon Him. 
is his strength. That he will help me to stand in the midst of it. But if I think I got this, I can do this, beware. That can be pride. You see where I'm coming from. You see what the scripture there is saying, okay? Many mature believers get caught up in pride. They believe in their own strength. They believe that they can resist temptations in their own strength. Let me tell you, you and I are no match to any demon. I'm going to say it again. We are no match to any demon within ourselves. But we are not within ourselves. We have been given authority and power to cast out devils where we find them. We have the authority to bind and loose in the name of Jesus. But I want you to know it is because of our God's strength within us that we can resist temptations, that we can combat the works of darkness. You know, some people want to call it willpower. I hear this a lot with drug addicts and those that are, are so bound by alcohol or porn, and we could go on and on with the list, but there are those that will say to them, well, you've just got to control that habit. You can do it. You have the willpower to do it. Well, most drug addicts, if you go back and look at them in a little while, what are they doing? They're using again, right? Because they're trying to do it in their own strength. They're trying to say, no, I don't want to do this. But if a demonic spirit has come through in that, he might let up a little bit, but you can just watch. He will try to come right back in to that individual to cause them to go right back to some kind of addiction that maybe they thought they were free from. Now, I know that there's organizations and groups that work with people that would be considered addicts, but let me say this to you. I'm not saying there are bad things that they teach, but without the ministry and the help of Jesus Christ, most likely they will stay bound. Okay? You understand? Matthew 16, verses 24 and 25. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. Let's look at this passage. Whoever wants to be my disciple, which we know that's the root word of discipline, must deny themselves. When you follow after the things of God, it is not always easy. Sometimes we think, well, you know, if I'm a Christian, that everything is going to be easy. But it's not necessarily so. You know, I've known, and you have too, those that were called maybe to other lands to preach the gospel. Well, that wouldn't have been on their first choice, but God was beginning to woo them into a direction to go into a specific place and preach. I remember a man, in fact, he pastors one of the biggest churches in Knoxville, but I remember when he sold his home and everything they had and they went to school in another state to be more educated in, in the ministry, so they went there, and when they finished, and God says it's enough, he allowed them to come back, but they didn't know that they were going to get to come back. So in selling everything, I mean, that was so difficult for them. They had built their dream home, but they were in that home. They were so excited, but God says, I want you to go over here. Let me interject this. I think you will enjoy it. But uh, years ago, Robert and I were raising our four children, and uh, it was just God that we were able to purchase a piano. I was so thrilled over that piano when we had it in my living room. And I'm certainly not good on the piano, but I like to pick at the piano and, and just sing a few of the old hymns, which I love. <laughs> but, you know, uh, I was in prayer one day, and uh, the same man I just mentioned that sold everything, he stood up in one of the first few services that he had, and he said, I want us to pray. He said, obviously, we need a piano. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, um, you know, we really want this because we'll be living this place where they were renting. They had a piano, but he said, we won't have one. 
Well, anyway, I went home and I wouldn't dare tell Robert because he would say, well, you need to give it away. But I wouldn't dare tell him that I was miserable every day, all day long, because I knew God had spoken to my heart. And I kept thinking, maybe he'll change his mind or he'll move on somebody else and they'll have the piano and I won't have to get rid of mine. Well, I did this for a whole week and I was so miserable. And I said, God, if this is what you're saying to me, I will give the piano. And God, I know you'll give me another one. So I told Robert, oh, he was on the phone calling them. Yeah, you can come get this piano. <laughs> <laughs> so sure enough, just in a matter of hours, we lived in Morristown at the time. They drove to Morristown, and I watched them take my piano out. And I didn't want them to see me, but the tears is pouring down my cheeks. So what was that? Crucifying the flesh. Doing what God called me to do when I'm honest. My flesh didn't want to do that. But, you know, once I released that piano into God's work, then a peace flooded my heart. You see, when you don't allow the peace of God to umpire in your heart, it is a miserable place. God knows what's right. He knows what's good. It wasn't but a few months later that God opened the door for me to get a better piano. Mm -hmm. And we were able to pay for that piano. So I want you to know is when we use the cliche, you can't outgive God, it's really a biblical truth. Mm -hmm. You give, and it will be given back to you, Scripture says. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, will men give unto you. So we must deny ourselves. If God is saying something, and you know in your heart that God is dealing with you about that, that's what you want to do. Notice, and take up their cross. Well, obviously, I'm not walking around with a wooden cross on my shoulder, but I am taking up my body and making it do what it's supposed to do. If we're born again, we have the Spirit of God within us. Our spirit man is born again, and I have the authority to make myself do what I'm supposed to do. Do you hear this? Now, if we're lost, we don't have Jesus Christ to help us, then we're not going to be able to take control over our flesh. But we can through the power of the name of Jesus and the workings of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said to take up your cross and follow me. So it may be easy to follow the Lord in some things, but it may not be so easy in other things. I know there's been many times it would be time for me to come here to the church and lead prayer watch or to teach a class or to even drive to Sevierville to do my TV programming. Did my flesh want to do it? No. I just wanted to call and say, you know, I just can't make it today, blah, 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 blah. Or Sunday morning, you know, uh, Lord, I just had such a busy day. Yesterday, I've been to the church every day. Lord, I just really don't feel like going Sunday morning and the whole time my heart is condemning me because Scripture says, forbid not the assembling of yourselves together. We are to be in the house of the Lord. I don't ask myself, do I want to go to church? I tell myself, you are going to church. And then I follow through. Amen? Amen. So that's not always easy, but we have to control by the working of the Holy Spirit in our spirit, man. So again, let's think about King David. We know he failed. Was it because of pride? Well, David's pride said that he could have another man's wife and there would not be consequences. That's pride. When you think you can commit a sin, you can talk evil, you can be ugly about your attitudes and think there's no consequences to that, let me tell you something. Sin opens the door for the enemy, the devil, to come in to steal, kill, and destroy now, let me say again, if things start going crazy in my life, things tearing up, just uh, a lot of arguing or, or bickering or these kind of things, first of all, I'm saying, Lord, if I if, did, I open the door for the enemy to come in. If I did, God, show me and I repent. Sometimes God has not shown me anything, but there has been times that God has said, you remember when you said blah, blah, blah? And I'll say, yes, Lord. He said, that was wrong. And I'll say, Lord, I call it sin, and I ask you to forgive me. I want to keep the doors shut to the enemy. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12, we quoted this earlier, take heed when you think that you stand, lest you fall. 
The second meaning I want us to look at tonight is pride is trusting in your own righteousness. Pride is trusting in your own righteousness. Now again, if you want to turn in your Bible, your, your phone, we're going to look at the book of Job. I remember there was a time that, and I'm being honest and open, but I did not like the book of Job. That was just not a book, and I was so tired of hearing people say, well, you know, Job, he suffered, so you're going to suffer too. Well, that's almost like getting my faith to believe I'm going to suffer. I mean, you know, but I did like the book of Job, but I think since God has, has really opened it up to me and, and others have taught me so many truths from the book of Job, and I trust that you will learn some things as well, it has really changed uh, my, my thoughts about the book of Job. But let's look at Job chapter 1, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Now I want you to know, he actually approaches the throne of God. If that went in the Bible, I would not believe that. Verse 7, And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou, or where are you coming from? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro, in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Now this is interesting, because if you'll remember, last week we saw the scripture that is said that Satan is like a roaring lion, notice, seeking whom he may devour. He's going to and fro, looking for whom he can destroy. So here we see it written in different words, but it is the same principle. So he just flat out tells God, I've been going to and fro. All right, in verse 8. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth? It says, A perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Now, fearing God is talking about a reverential fear of God, and we need that before our Father. We should never take our God for granted. And uh, I don't know if any of you are affiliated with the Catholic Church, but I had to go to a Catholic Church for some of the studies that I had to do and to observe and to write about it. And the one thing that I did notice about the Catholics is they went into the sanctuary and they were very reverential of God. They took their seat. You didn't see anybody whispering or giggling or fellowshipping, they sit down, they were very quiet. Some of them would bow their head like they were praying. I don't know if they were or not, but I thought, you know, I appreciate that. You know, even though we house the Spirit of God, God lives on the inside of us, there is something so beautiful about going into a sanctuary and people are revering the, the, the Lord by not laughing and carrying on. And I'm guilty. I do it, so I'm not pointing at anybody else. I remember when we were in Cuba and we went into the little church and we could see nobody, but there was a thunder of voices in that church. And I mean, they were praying to the top of their voice. It was so powerful, but I couldn't see anybody, but I looked closer and everybody in the church was on their knees, crying out to God for those services. And I'm thinking, wow, bring us back to that, Lord, that it's not a time to fellowship. We can fellowship after church or before church, in the foyer, on the parking lot. And again, I raise my hand. I'm guilty. I've done that too. But to see the reverence of God in the sanctuary is so beautiful. And by the way, after that prayer meeting, and I had the privilege of preaching, we saw miracles take place there. We saw many come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Nobody has air conditions, so the windows were open with some little wooden uh, pieces across the, the window. And as far as I could see out the windows, people were gathered in the streets to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God moved on those prayers. So, so it's a beautiful thing to honor the Lord with those kinds of things. And so let's look at this. Um, in verse 9, Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught or for nothing? Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands. 
and his substance to increase in, in the land, is increased in the land. But put forth thy hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. Now, with that in mind, when the Lord said, Have you considered my servant Job? It's almost like he and, and uh, Satan, well, she's, you know, the Lord and Satan are working together to do something bad. That is not the case here at all. Job has sin in his life. And we're going to look at what that sin is. The scripture is very clear. And when I saw that, I mean literally, it helped me with this passage. Because for me, the problem that I had, let me see if I can find it where. Um, Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to, okay, has thou been sitting in my job? Okay, and here's what the Lord says. A perfect, he begins to describe, God begins to describe Job, and he said that he is a perfect and upright man, one that fears God and excuse or resists evil. But let me say this about perfect. The way you and I looked at perfect, it means there's no flaws and there's nothing wrong with that individual. There is nobody like that except <coughs> the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only one that is perfect and upright. So what is God saying? He is perfect and an upright man because he had a love for God and the things of God. His heart was pure and his intentions were pure. But what he did, we're going to see in just a minute, what he did though was sin. This is what I want you to catch. All right. So we see that Job is in Satan's power. There are three friends that come to Job to comfort him. And you know they were not much comfort, right? In other words, you don't want these kinds of friends. But they <coughs> did speak a lot of truth into Job's life. They kept saying to Job, Are you sure that there is not an open door against you? Have you given place to the devil? Well, you know, every time we know Job says, Oh, no, I've, I've done it all right. I've not opened the door for the wicked one to come in. He says all of these things. But you know, when you look at Job uh, in Scripture, and I'm not going to read all the things, but you know, he had boils on his body. I don't know if you've ever had a boil. I know even what I call a canker sore. They're so painful. They hurt horribly. He had those all over his body to the point he was scraping his skin because the worms would get into those open wounds in his body. I mean, you're talking about a man suffering. He is suffering after the devil came to him. We know that all of his children, all of them, died in a building that fell in on them. One place that I see that there's sin is Job offered sacrifices for his children every day. You can go back and read this part. He offered sacrifices every day. Why? Because he was afraid that they would sin against God and die. Notice what he was afraid of, that they would die. You see, Scripture says the thing that sometimes we fear the most can come upon us. If you have any fear, you need to take authority over a spirit of fear and demand it to go from you in Jesus' name. And then find the promises of God that will combat your fear and begin to decree and to declare those against the works of darkness. Do not allow fear into your life. And when you see it in your family, make sure that you war against that spirit of fear and if possible, speak into their life that they must not fear. It's very, very dangerous. And I've shared with you a little bit, but it literally cost me my life. It is the mercy of God that I was able to come back into my body and live. And it was all because of fear in my personal life. So I know firsthand about fear. But you know, all of his animals was destroyed. Uh, his fields were destroyed. But you know, every time they would ask Job, are you sure you've not opened the door? Because they knew the enemy could come in because of sin. And he kept saying no to them. Well, you know, after this goes on and on and on, you remember there was a younger one than these so-called friends of Job. And his name is Elihu. And Elihu, he tried to be quiet, but he was just boiling inside because there was so much he wanted to say, but he had to be quiet. 
But anyway, after listening to the conversations for a while, he has said nothing, but finally he feels that he has his opportunity to speak. The, the Bible tells us in Job 32 and verse 1, So these three men ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. Do you see that passage? He was righteous in his own eyes. You see, I don't care what you do or what you don't do. You are not righteous because of your works. You are only righteous because of the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that washes us and cleanses us. And Scripture then calls righteousness a gift that He gives to us, the gift of righteousness. But that wasn't the way Job had looked at all of this. Job 32, verse 2, it says, Then was kindled the wrath of the anger of Elihu, the son of Bereshel, the Buzite of the kindred of Ram, against Job. So in other words, Elihu is upset with Job. He was so angry because Job had justified himself rather than God. Now, I want you to notice, it's like Job felt like that he did things so right and so good that he deserved to be free from all this torment that he had in his body, the deaths of all of his children, all of the animals, all of, if you will, his finances was destroyed. So he's saying there is no reason this should happen because I'm righteous. I do everything right. Nobody does everything right. And the quicker the church learns that, a lot better off are we going to be. Amen. Mm -hmm. Because he justified himself. And then 33, <clears throat> 8 and 9. Surely thou hast spoken in mine hearing, and I have heard the voice of thy word, saying, I am clean without transgression. I am innocent, neither is there iniquity in me. What is that? That's pride. And I want you to notice, now this is the words that Job is saying. I am innocent. There is no iniquity in me. He is also saying another way to say, I am pure without transgression. Do you know he would have had to have been Jesus himself for these things to be true in his life? So Job has pride. And then in 36, verse 3, Elihu says, I will fetch, and that means I will get my knowledge from afar and will ascribe righteousness to my maker. So Elihu is making a point to Job. You see, in other words, he's saying, I will study abroad. I might go off to another place and study. Or it can also mean that I study abroad or the knowledge from afar means God is the one who teaches me and reveals truth to me. But the big part I want you to focus in on and will ascribe, or I'm going to say that God, my maker, is the righteous one. Not me, but God. Now, he gives me the gift of righteousness. He gives you the gift of righteousness. And we can put on righteousness. The Bible even calls it a robe of righteousness. What do you do with a robe? You put it on. You wear it as your own. But really, it is the righteousness of God that I'm clothed in that, not my own. What's the scripture say about our righteousness? It is as filthy, filthy rags. rags. That's right. Filthy rags. That's our righteousness. So 3389, Surely thou hast spoken in mine hearing, and I've heard the voice of thy word, saying, I am clean without transgression. I am innocent, neither is there iniquity in me. And then, uh, again, I will ascribe, if you will, righteousness to the Lord. I will ascribe that. Job says, I have done this, and I've done that. If you'll read the book of Job again, he was always saying, I do this, and he was bragging on himself of the good that he's done. Now, he may have done a lot of good things, and that's great. We want to be doers of God's work, and we're created unto righteousness. Amen? But we are also to do the works of God as He leads and guides me. But I can assure you, I don't care how much work you do, it will not buy you righteousness. And if any of us thinks that it does, then that is pride. 
And again, it will open the door for the enemy to come in to steal, kill, and destroy. Job counted his personal works as righteousness rather than what God had done for him. He looked at his own works. Righteousness comes again by God. We are not righteous by what we do. Again, it's only by the blood of Jesus, his righteousness alone. When you believe in your own righteousness again, it's pride. Again, mature believers fall prey to pride in this area. When we first got saved, we knew that we were righteous. We knew that we were righteous because of what Jesus had done. We had asked Jesus to come into our hearts. We're born again, and we know our need for the Lord. We're, we're young in the faith, and we know we have to have Him. But you know, sometimes after we've been saved for many years, whether it's 10 years or 20 years or maybe 30 and sometimes more for some of us, <coughs> But I want you to know, after we've been in the things of God for a while, we have a tendency, and this is a good thing, but to learn the Word. And, you know, we go out and we minister and we teach and we share. And all of that, that's a good thing. But I want you to know that if I start depending on my ability, my righteousness, and my strength, it becomes pride in my life. Now, again, I know none of you have ever done this, but if you ever had somebody to, to, to rebuke you, I had a class one time, and this guy got me uh, after the service, and he was about the age of my kids, and he's trying to preach to me what I had just preached, but from his perspective, and I'm always open to things that people have learned, but he was correcting a lot of things I had said. It was just, I'm sorry, it was rude, and I didn't agree with him, and, but inside, flesh started rising up, and it's like, Bless God, who do you think you are? You're just a kid. You're still wet behind the ears. And I've been around a lot longer than you. That's pride. You all don't do that, but I did. And I realized what I was doing. And I said, Lord, forgive me. I was wrong. Because certainly so, even children can teach me things that I don't know. Amen? Amen. God can use whoever he will, even a donkey. Okay? So I had to repent of that. But sometimes as we do get older... We have a sense of pride that, you know, I've been around a lot longer than you or I know more than you. That is not even necessarily true. They may know a lot more than we do. But the big thing, let's do not get into pride. We are righteous again only because of what Jesus has done to Jesus alone. When we start believing that our works is what makes us righteous, again, that's pride. Now let's look, and I know our time is running out, but let's look at Luke 18, if you will. Luke 18. <clears throat> and I'm going to look at, at verse 10. So Jesus said, two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Now, obviously, there is nothing wrong with you lifting your face toward heaven. Obviously, we worship that way a lot of times. That's not the point here. The point is one had religious spirits, if you will. He had trusted in his own strength. He felt like it was his righteousness because he had done all these things. But the other man, he knew that his righteousness was his filthy rags, and he knew that he needed the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So God, we, the, the, what he's saying, God, thank you that I'm not like others. Job did this for 31 chapters. When you read the whole book, Job is always saying, I did this, I did that. So let me check our time. So I'm going to just stop right there. We'll start um, 
we will finish this because I don't want any of it wasted. I tell you, it's always the quickest hour when I'm with you all. It just goes by so quick. But the Word of God is so good. And um, I hope you're learning. You feel like you're learning something. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and if nothing else, these are things that you can share with others when they're thinking, well, I, I'm a Christian. You know, <laughs> devils aren't in my life, but they may need you to cast that off of them and out of their lives in the name of Jesus. I am not asking anyone to come up here at all. Anytime, though, you want prayer, I'm here for you. But if you are dealing with any kind of pride, I've been open with you tonight about my own pride, and I've had my share of it. But I've asked God to forgive me. But if there is anything where you feel like you have believed in your own strength, you believed in your own ability, you know, Scripture says it so beautifully, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, do not lean into your own understanding, but in all of your ways acknowledge the Lord, and He will direct your path. We know that we need Him. Now, don't laugh at me, but I've gotten pretty good at getting my van in this little space that I have in the garage. It should have plenty of space, it's my fault, but there's not a lot of space. And Robert said, well, you, you're really close on that corner or you're really close over here. And I want to say, I'm driving, okay? I am driving. Okay, that's not nice. But anyway, every time I pull in that driveway inside and said, Lord, help me to get this car in. I don't want to damage my car and I don't want to knock the garage door off of the siding and I don't want to do any of those things. But it's something I acknowledge the Lord with. When you get in your car and you take off in it, have you acknowledged the Lord for the day? I know we can't acknowledge Him in every single detail, but let me tell you, when you get in that car, it is a dangerous thing. When you go out on the highway, it is dangerous. We don't fear, but we acknowledge we need the protecting hand of our God. Amen? So acknowledge Him. When you feel a little uneasy about something, Maybe somebody in your family, and you start having just some bad vibes about that something is wrong. Don't just let that slide by. Go somewhere and take authority over any demons that's assigned against your family or something assigned against you. I'm, I'm just going to share this, but Mother got in the car tonight, and she was weeping. And she said, there's just something wrong. And, she, and I, I'd, I'd already, I knew it. I knew that in the realm of the Spirit, there was something wrong. And she finished talking about it. Well, we just three. We stopped in the car, and man, we started in on any devil that was going to try to work against us or any of you in the name of Jesus or our family. We just started taking authority over him and started decreeing the word of the Lord that we were shielded and we were protected from him. Don't ever take those things lightly. You don't fear but at the same time, if you don't obey God to do what you know you should do, you need to be afraid. Do you see? Because God is showing us. He is talking to us. He loves you. I love the scripture. If I gave you my son Jesus, the Father said, would I not with him freely give you all things? That's the love of our God. So we're just going to bow our head right now before the Lord. And if you feel that God has revealed a place in your life that has been prideful, just simply confess that to Jesus. Just right now, just take authority over that in Jesus' name. Confess that to Jesus. Now, I take authority over every demon of hell that's trying to come in through pride. The window, the door, we say you have no place in our lives. I demand you to loose each one of us. You go to the dry places and seek rest and find none. You are not going to hold us in your bondage in the name of Jesus. For whom the Son has made free is free indeed in the name of Jesus. And Lord, now we thank you that we reign with you in Jesus' name. Now, Father, I ask you to protect everyone as they travel home. I declare the blood around their mind, their bodies, their vehicles, and their families. Father God, strengthen them, Lord. Deliver them from injuries, from sickness and disease. 
Father God, just minister to all their family that not one of them would perish, but they would all come to you, Jesus, to be saved or to get their lives right before you, Father. Thank you for anointing, Lord, our ears to hear what you would say. We hear your voice, Jesus, the good shepherd, and the voice of the stranger we will not follow. In the mighty name of Jesus, seal these words in the hearts of your people. And God, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. 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 Thank you for being here, and the Lord's will will be back next week. If not, maybe I'll see you in the rapture. How's that? <laughs> I'm ready. I am very ready.